All right, I'm gonna give you my top 13 IB Biology exam tips. Starting with number 13. Remember that all numbers need units. Example question here, state the cumulative increase in the mass of control colonies at seven weeks. So you would find your seven weeks. Okay, you would look for the control colonies with this dotted line. And then you would use your ruler. Okay, here's seven weeks. And you would lay your ruler so that you could see exactly where the line crosses your y-axis, making sure your line is exactly parallel with the x-axis. Okay, it should cross at about 230. But if you just state 230, you're going to get zero marks. You must include the unit. Okay, now as a reminder, IB puts their units on the other side of a slash. Remember, we often will put our units in parentheses. Don't be confused by this slash and don't write the slash in your answer. I've seen students write 230 slash G because they misinterpret what that little slash root means. All it is is it's separating the title of this axis with the units. So just write the units next to the number and you're good to go. Number 12. Don't say approximate or give a range of numbers. Instead, choose the single best number and state it with confidence. Okay, I see students all the time giving a range of values because they don't know exactly where that line is going to cross the axis. Okay, don't do that. You need to instead choose one single number. Okay, put it out there with that unit. Number 11, use IB level vocabulary throughout the exam. Okay, if you're asked to outline the process of inspiration in humans, okay, well, technically it's correct that as the lungs get bigger, okay, the pressure decreases, but you're not going to get a mark for that. The mark scheme uses IB level vocab. We don't say the lungs get bigger. We say the volume of the lungs increases. We're using that term volume. We're indicating what's happening to it. Okay, that vocabulary is necessary to score marks on the IB exam. Okay, general, like sort of common language isn't going to cut it. Similarly, just calling this the chest isn't going to cut it. The chest we know from our study of anatomy it is known as the thorax or thoracic cavity. So just make sure you are using those terms for every single answer that you write. Number 10, you will have five minutes of reading time before each test begins. Okay, you are not allowed to write any notes or use a calculator during that reading time. So my recommendation is read through as much of the test as you can with a focus on reading the context for the DBQ. There's a lot of background in the DBQ that's going to be really helpful, okay, if you've read it during that reading time. And also, if you're doing paper two, flip over to section B, take a look at those questions, and decide which ones you want to answer. Remember that in that section, SL students will answer one of the two questions, HL students will answer two out of three questions. Remember that each of those questions is going to have an A, B, and C. So when it says answer one question, that doesn't mean answer 6A. That means answer either 6A, B, and C or 7A, B, and C. No mixing and matching allowed. HL students, two out of those three. So a total of six sub-questions will be answered in page, section B. Number nine. Make sure your handwriting is legible, not too big, not too small. If an examiner can't read your handwriting, they can't give you marks for what you have written. Please make sure they can read what you have to say. If you know something and then you don't write it legibly, right? That's such a waste of all that knowledge that you had. Just get it written well. Okay, um, and just a reminder, you need to use a pencil for the paper 1A multiple choice questions, as well as any drawing skills that might show up on paper 1B or paper 2. All other writing must be in blue or black ballpoint pen. Don't use a gel pen. It can bleed through okay, to the back of that page and mess up your response back there. Okay, And it also, there can be issues when they're scanning with the heat. So just use a standard ballpoint pen. Number eight. Use the word correlation when describing relationships between variables. It can either be a positive correlation, a negative correlation, or no correlation. Don't use that term relationship. Use the term correlation or just spell out what the correlation is. The greater the true brain case height, the greater the body mass. That works just, just perfectly as well. Number seven. 
read the question twice carefully to make sure you are answering exactly what the question asks. For example, if you're asked to distinguish between levels of predation in marmots born in the wild and those born in captivity, and you kind of casually think to yourself, well, I'm going to refer to that as the death rate, that's not going to cut it. Okay, unfortunately, there's a lot of other ways marmots can die besides being eaten by a predator, right? They can not have enough access to food or water. Or there can be weather events. So it's very important that you don't just kind of lazily start talking about something in a different way than how it's asked. If they ask you about levels of predation, you need to talk about levels of predation in your answer. Number six. Now, I've split it into two because there are two command terms that have important rules about what to say, okay, that aren't super explicit in the word. So the first one is discuss. If you are discussing, that means you need to present an argument and a counter argument. For example, discuss how helpful these studies of bears can be in developing an understanding of osteoporosis in humans. You'll want to have one reason the studies are helpful. It can help us understand how bears avoid osteoporosis. But you also need a counter argument. Okay? However, okay, the studies aren't helpful, okay, because humans don't hibernate. Okay? They're not inactive for long periods like bears are. And so you'll want to make sure you address both sides of that argument. Okay? Similarly, if the command term is evaluate, you need both a strength and a limitation of whatever you're asked to evaluate. Okay, so here I've just cut this down for simplicity. A hypothesis has been proposed that blah, blah, blah. Evaluate the evidence for this hypothesis provided by the data. So first, you could say there's a positive correlation. There it is again, or a negative correlation. But make sure that you have a limitation. A lot of times for these types of questions, the limitation can be that the correlation that you identified in mark A does not prove causation. Okay, we know that's a nature of science that is clear in science. We never say that we've absolutely proved anything. Okay, we can just say that we can identify a correlation, but we can't say that that's necessarily one variable causing the other variable to behave in that way. Number five, you don't need to restate the question in the response. Just answer it. If the command term is state, your answer can be very brief to save you time. Okay, state the trophic level of the sea urchin, primary consumer. That's all you need. You don't need to take the time to restate the question. Use that time instead to go back and check your responses. Add additional uh, potential marks onto the responses that you um, already had started on your first run through. Number four, start a paper two question by defining any vocabulary words found in the question. There is often a mark available for defining a vocabulary word, even if a definition is not directly asked for. Here are two examples of that. Explain how the experiment is an indirect measurement of transpiration. Note, they don't ever ask you to define transpiration. However, the first mark is, sure enough, a definition of transpiration. So that's a good place to start, especially if you are struggling with how to get going on a question. Here's a second example. Outline the effect of carrying capacity on the growth of a population. Nowhere is it asking you to define carrying capacity. Yet again, that is the first mark. So define those vocab words um, and then go on to answer the question as best you can after that. Number three, when asked to compare and contrast, make sure to state at least one similarity and one difference directly comparing the same aspect of each thing you are comparing in each statement. Be sure to mention both things you are comparing in each statement. So if you're asked to compare and contrast some results for winter and spring, okay, I'm going to have a similarity. Both have low brain case height. Okay, or you could say both winter and spring have low brain case height. Then here's our differences. There's a greater, greater body mass in spring than in winter, or there's more variation in body mass in spring than in winter. Note, I've mentioned both the things I'm comparing in each of these statements. Okay, those are oftentimes going to be the contrast that we also notice. Whether something is like greater, less, higher, lower, and then whether something has more variation or a greater range. Those are generally going to show up 
as comparisons. Number two, don't just say that something was affected or impacted. How was it affected? Did it increase, decrease? Okay, this is an example from the old curriculum, but we used to have to know phosphorus is important as a fertilizer. And if you stated then that a drop in phosphate could affect agricultural productivity, that doesn't mean anything. Is it positively affecting it? Is it negatively affecting it? Just saying something is affected or impacted is meaningless. So you need to say negative, positive, or just spell it out. A drop in phosphate could lead to lower agricultural productivity. And number one, use comparative language. Stop listing numbers without comparing them in those compare and contrast and distinguish questions. These types of answers should only have numbers in the answer if it's indicating where a trend is changing. Don't list values without comparing them. Look for the most important trends and identify those. So don't list numbers like the ventilation rate at 4,000 meters was 20 decimeters cubed per minute and at sea level was 15 decimeters cubed per minute. IB does not consider this a comparison. You're just listed out two numbers. Now you might think to yourself, of course this one is higher than that, but you can't just think that in your head. You need to state it and you don't need to list the numbers. So instead, what you should say is the ventilation rate at 4,000 meters was higher than the ventilation rate at sea level for all levels of aerobic power was part of that question. So use comparative words, faster, slower, sooner, later, longer, shorter, more, fewer, higher, lower. Don't list numbers without comparing them, okay? And you don't even have to take the time to list those numbers. All they want is that comparative word. Again, the only time you're gonna see a number in a compare and contrast or distinguish is if it's identifying where a trend is changing. All right, hope that helps and good luck out there.